Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in again to listen to our uh, webinar series of Mining Insights. This is uh, episode six in our series. If you've missed some of the earlier episodes, you can find them on our website under Perspectives and Events. Uh, my name is Rachel Spate. I'm one of the partners in our mining practice, and I'm delighted today to have my, my colleague Hallam Chow from our Beijing office. Um, Hallam's going to talk to us today about Chinese outbound investment in the mining industry and how this has been before and after, after COVID-19. So, Hallam, can I hand over to you to, to discuss this very interesting topic? Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. And this is Hallam Chow. I'm a partner and head of projects of China. And I'm also pleased of the opportunity to talk to all of you about the Chinese outbound investment uh, in the mining industry, in particular from a historical context as well as going forward uh, after COVID-19 and what is the appetite of the Chinese mining companies in their investment. As I said on today's topic, we will first look into the Chinese outbound investment from a historical context by sharing with you as to the major sectors that the Chinese mining companies are investing in and the countries of interest, a comparison with other outbound investment in the mining industry by other countries to see whether China is doing the same thing or something different. Secondly, we'll look into the specific risk factor that a Chinese mining company will look into during COVID-19. Thirdly, we'll look into the impact of COVID-19 on a Chinese mining company's outbound investment appetite and what areas they're looking into, and in particular, which mining resource would of particular interest to the Chinese mining company going forward. And lastly, as to what a Chinese mining company will look into in an after COVID-19 world. First, let me share with you a historical context and a picture as to overseas investment of Chinese mining companies. The overseas investment volume of China's mining industry increased from approximately US 1.4 billion in 2003 to a high point of 24.8 billion US dollars in 2013. However, the current China overseas mining investment is at a relatively low level where the investment volume decreased substantially since 2014, but again rebounded in 2017 to 2018. So as you can see, from 2016 at a low of 75, upward to 114, and then in 2018, approximately 100 billion. What mining resources and which country are of particular interest from a historical perspective for China overseas mining investment? They are in fact quite highly concentrated in terms of mineral types. Among the mines that were invested by Chinese mining companies, copper, they are 75, gold, 72, iron ore, 58, and coal, 51 projects, which account for nearly 75% of the total China Overseas Mining Investment Projects. This slide demonstrates as to the countries of interest for Chinese mining companies. As of 2019, more than 65% of the 370 somewhat overseas mining projects that are participated or operated by Chinese mining companies are concentrated in the Asia Pacific region approximately 179 of them, and Africa, 70. And by country, the projects were mainly located in Australia with 120, Canada, 34, Mongolia, 11, Zambia, 15, South Africa, 12, the Democratic Republic of Congo, 12, and Kyrgyzstan, 12, which represent an aggregate share of over 60% of the total number of overseas mining investment projects of China. And this information has been supported and provided by S&P Global Market Intelligence.
Now, despite the successful story and also the um, press information regarding the significant outbound investment made by Chinese mining companies, as compared with other outbound investment in the mining industry by other countries, China in fact still lags behind leading mining countries in the number of overseas mining investment projects and in production mining projects as of 2019. This chart demonstrates that Canada and Australia far exceed China by nearly fourfold and even tenfold of the outbound investment projects. Nearly half of the Chinese projects, approximately 44%, are suspended or actually inactive due to various reasons. And of the active 199 summer projects, only 55 of them are in fact in production and operation, and most of the remaining projects are in various stages of exploration, feasibility study, architectural design or construction, and trial production. That's probably the reason why we have seen a gradual slowdown of outbound Chinese mining company investment, because some of the mining companies that have made investment are still waiting for the project that which they are working on in order to go into production and operations first. What are the risk factors that a Chinese mining company will look into during COVID-19? As you see below, most of the considerations are probably not dissimilar to an international mining company. Since the COVID-19 outbreak was announced by the WHO as a public health emergency of international concern, all countries have actually issued relevant policies for the prevention and control of the virus. And there are two major types of control measures which significantly impact a Chinese mining company doing outbound investment. Immigration control measures involving Chinese personnel, custom clearance for goods from China, other major risk factor considerations for a Chinese mining company include policy, economic risks, market risks, currency fluctuation risks, financing risks, and legal risks, not dissimilar to other international mining companies. What are the policy risks? Immigration control measures aimed at Chinese personnel is of a particular concern. The business negotiators, project managers, or workers could not arrive or timely arrive in the host country of the project in order to conduct the work or business and management activities due to domestic quarantine and immigration control measures. Secondly, the control measures aim at trade of Chinese goods. A lot of the minor machinery and equipment or raw materials, including port customs, clearance control, inspection and quarantine requirements, basically delay the process of putting Chinese invested mines into production and operation. In further, mineral or shipment restrictions. Certain project host companies have in fact closed the border ports to control the spread of the epidemic, preventing products from being shipped there too. Chinese mining companies similarly face the same economic risk as an international mining company. And we all know that the product prices and the investment returns of mining investment projects are in fact more affected by the economic development cycle than any other industry. Under the impact of COVID-19, China's economy is facing a downward pressure in the short term. UBS and Goldman Sachs both lowered their forecast for Chinese economic growth rate in the first quarter to about 3.8% and 4% respectively. And I believe the numbers are perhaps lower now, despite the recent upspike of the China's economic growth recovery. China's economic stagnation caused by the epidemic has affected the upstream and the downstream industries related to China in a global industrial chain. Market risks. Commodity price was already volatile prior to the outbreak of COVID-19. Base metal prices fell first and then rose in 2019 due to trade fictions and a global macroeconomic trend. And they rebounded in the first, fourth quarter of 2019 amid the easing of the China-US trade frictions 
and the stabilization and recovery of China's economic economy. And we, as we all know, during the recent increase of the friction between China and the U.S., the base metal prices will probably be affected again. They plummeted, in fact, in a panic in early 2020 due to epidemic. So given the frequent fluctuation in the commodity prices, mining companies can only rely on the frequent use of hedging and other measures to avoid operating risks. And the Chinese companies are facing similar issues at this point. Currency fluctuation risks. There's significant increasing devaluation pressure on renminbi. And the market participants in China become more risk averse amid COVID-19. And the interest spread between China and the US is expected to narrow. Having cut interest rates nearly three times in 2019, the US Fed will adopt a more cautious approach going forward. And meanwhile, China's central bank has increased its efforts to cut reserve ratios and interest rates to counter the effects of the epidemic. And on a medium term basis, there is depreciation pressure on the renminbi as COVID-19 negatively impacts on China's export of goods and services. The China-US trade agreements require China to expand imports from the US and the narrowing of the trade surplus will reduce China's current account surplus and may result in a deficit, thus resulting in a depreciation pressure from the Chinese central bank on renminbi. When the renminbi exchange rate fluctuates, a mining company's operating performance will be affected to a certain degree in terms of project return, cost, debt repayment ability, and exchange losses. Therefore, for M&A and outbound investment, the renminbi depreciation is going to cause a material difference between the exchange rate projections of investing companies and project host countries and lead to large discrepancies between the price expectation of the two sides, thus cooling down the investment appetite of certain Chinese mining companies. Financing risks. Clearly, given COVID-19, liquidity pressure of the banking system is going to negatively impact upon the availability of costs of financing for overseas projects. Presently, many of the Chinese financial institutions are prioritizing the financing needs of key enterprises in China onshore in the prevention and control of COVID-19. Hence, limited liquidity would then constrain the room for funding overseas projects which are being viewed as economically difficult and also um, politically risky. And as the central bank releases liquidity, many of the PLC domestic banks will then provide aid to distressed companies locally by lowering lending rates, granting extensions, and also waiving relevant fees. Therefore, the bank's profit pressure may then be transferred to the overseas lending, thus increasing the lending cost for what they perceive as more risky projects with a lower return. And of course, last and below least are the legal risks. There are clearly contract performance risks during COVID-19. Pandemic cost project delays may lead to increased cost and reduced revenue. And many overseas project owners may reject subcontracting with obtaining equipment from Chinese subcontractors or suppliers eventually leading to the risk of contract defaults and even project termination. Further, there are significant risks of changes in laws and regulations. The host country may enact temporary laws, decrease regulations in relation to COVID-19, such as immigration measures or minimum tax in order to deal with idle projects, thus increasing the cost of the operation for mining companies. So is it all loom and doom for the Chinese mining companies going outbound? Will there be no longer outbound investment opportunities or appetite from a Chinese mining company in acquiring mining assets outside? I think the answer is no. There are certain characteristics of the mining industry are naturally 
favorable, notwithstanding the epidemic. Continuous production throughout the year, relatively closed production areas, little mobility of the personnel that's limiting the spread of the pandemic, and there's also abundant inventories of the raw materials. Therefore, the impact of the epidemic on overseas mining investment would vary depending on the type of investment, the specific stage of a project, and the relevant measures adopted by the project host company, uh, host country to cope with COVID-19. Let's now look at the various considerations of a Chinese mining company in respect of um, their latest appetite by focusing on equity investment, greenfield investment. How does China deal with the supply and the demand fluctuation? And which mining resource would be of particular interest to a Chinese mining company? First, let's turn to equity investment. The main issue that a Chinese mining company face is the certainty in respect of the closing. Many cross-border M&A transactions are based on competitive bidding or public tender, where transaction certainty is an important consideration. And the Chinese investors will need to complete a series of domestic filing and approval processes for overseas investment, including approval from the NDRC, National Development and Reform Commission, Moscow, Ministry of Commerce, as well as perhaps if it is state-owned, SESAC, and lastly, the Administration of Foreign Exchange, SAFE, for the outbound investment. The approval process could be delayed due to disruptive operation of the government, which may further increase concerns on the seller side about the uncertainties in obtaining the governmental approvals. So, as we have seen recently, the Gangfeng Lithium regarding subscription for shares in Minera Exa in Argentina clearly talk about the issue on obtaining approval from the local country, i.e. China's relevant authorities and consents, which may cause a significant delay, and those approvals and consents may not be obtained as a risk factor regarding the certainty in closing. Chinese mining companies tend to like to negotiate in person and travel limitation and quarantine measures have affected the availability of personnel needed in the project as well as due diligence, which is critical for the high-risk mining projects. For example, the acquisition of the Zambian copper assets of First Quantum by Jiangxi Copper has been delayed, and they have been in talk with Jiangxi Copper on the sale since September of 2019, and the negotiation has been interrupted by the virus breakout in China and face-to-face -face discussion between the two companies basically had not materialized yet. Greenfield investment. The following chart shows the current overseas assets and overseas revenue of some of the largest mining companies in China and the number of overseas employees that they have. So you will see that clearly certain of the mining companies already have significant overseas assets. And if and to the extent, as I mentioned before, a significant number of these projects are still um, in hiatus and have not gone into production or operation yet, then many of these mining companies will then begin to try to digest the original greenfield investment first in order for them to move on to make other greenfield investment projects. Therefore, the appetite on greenfield investment projects probably will be lower than those other projects which are already in the construction and or production phase. For projects which are in the exploration, construction, and technical improvement stage, during the construction stage, such as equipment installation and commissioning, generally will require the participation of Chinese technical personnel, which may account for over 50% of the total personnel at such time. Similarly, during the technical improvement stage, also needs a high percentage of Chinese personnel, especially where the project 
has a relatively weak technical foundation or faces more technical challenges. And given the immigration restrictions, mining projects in these stages are under significant impact from the epidemic. For example, the zero to the minimum copper sink mine of Zhongjing Ningnan, non ferment has indicated that the technical improvement phase is, has been significantly delayed given the current situation. The following slide shows the current main projects and some of the largest projects as for some of the larger Chinese mining companies in various countries and the current phase of which they are in that involve exploration, construction, and technical improvement. And as far as we know, many of these projects are currently suffering delay at this stage. However, for those projects which are in the operation phase, the impact on the mining project in the operation stage is somewhat limited, but we need to face the shipping disruption risks. Shipping disruption clearly affects the ability of overseas mines to deliver the ores. For example, Rio Tinto said on February 12 of this year that the Mongolian government had basically shut down the cold shipment through four border crossings between Mongolia and China in order to prevent the spread of the virus. And the shipment of copper concentrates from its oil and oil copper gold mine to China has been significantly affected. And many of those mining projects invested by Chinese companies in Mongolia are being affected by such anti-epidemic measures. Supply and demand fluctuation. Downstream non-ferrous metals smelting companies face increasing pressure to cut production. Product inventory and in-transit inventories of copper, aluminum, lead, and zinc smelting companies are generally over twice of those in previous years due to the negative impact in logistics and transportation. Constraint of shipment of raw materials has led to output reduction of aluminum by 1.5 million tons, accounting for about 2% of the operating capacity. And there's clearly risk of stockpiling of the byproduct sulfuric acid for copper, lead, and zinc smelting because of restrictions on transportation and the lack of special vehicles. So because of that, even when we are in operation, the Chinese mine company would have a concern as to this type of supply and demand fluctuation. Other issues that faces an outbound investment appetite are the final demand, impact on the final consuming industries. So we're looking to the real estate sector, infrastructure, and electric power. Home sales within China are expected to decline due to reduced income. So clearly the demand of steel and other raw material will also be affected. Infrastructure is going to play a more prominent role during an economic downturn as a buffer for the economy. So in this case, we can see the Chinese government is expected to step up counter-cyclical adjustments to support the economy by increasing infrastructure spending significantly. Electric power. State grid has been reducing grid investment even before the epidemic. The 2020 investment target is set at RMB 408 billion, showing an approximately 8.8 .8 reduction from 2019. So this is likely to have a significant impact on the consumption of non-ferrous metals, given that the electric power industry accounts for 45% of the total consumption of copper and 10% of aluminum in China. Other industries that impact upon the mining company's urban investment would include the automobile industry, of course, the global automotive supply chain heavily relies on China with more than 80% of all the auto parts being made in China. And the Chinese auto parts companies have delayed the resumption of production as staff are quarantined and logistics are at a standstill. For example, Fiat Chrysler said on February 15 that its plant in Serbia suspended production. But we are seeing a recovery of such production at this point. 
So this part may be released um, during the recovery in China. Home appliances, clearly because of plummeting uh, home sales, there are significant difficulties result from suspended production and plummeting offline sales of home appliances. So by now we have seen as to the different consideration of a Chinese mining company going abroad because of macroeconomic factors, the pandemic, and the inherent nature of the risk factor for a, China, for a mining company itself. Then which mining resource will a Chinese mining company be interested in? Let's look at the following. Gold. Demand is dropping in China significantly in the short term, but is expected to rebound notably after the pandemic. All major gold retailers closed their physical stores during the initial outbreak, which would have been the peak sales seasons in China because of Chinese New Year. But China's demand for gold jewelry is generally robust, which accounts for about 30% of the world's total, second only to India. Therefore, gold jewelry sales are expected to show a similar pattern this time as during the SARS period, and gold jewelry demand will be rebounding strongly after the epidemic. Copper. The global supply and demand balance of copper ore will be broken in the short term. Labor-intensive midstream and downstream industries of copper smelting and processing are likely to be negatively impacted due to production suspension. Shipping has also been affected and many scheduled services have been suspending and hindering the transportation of copper ores. However, the reduction in China's copper ore demand will not cause the risk of stockpile swelling of mines because copper remains a relatively scarce type of ore resources. And among all the basic metal varieties, copper mines tend to have the longest investment and construction period. Given the limited volume of copper ore mining, Copper ores are generally in short supply amid increasing demand, and the reduction for China's demand for copper should only be temporary. Copper smelting and processing activities are also expected to return to normal gradually once the epidemic is over, and so will the demand of copper. Sink. Demand will decline in the short term. Downstream industries, including sink smelting and deep processing, are likely to witness negative impact similar to those of copper. However, real estate, transportation, and automobile sectors would also experience a slowdown, even without an epidemic factor, and so would the demand for sink as well. From a long-term investment perspective, a Chinese mining company will look into the long-term investment and operation cycle. Epidemic only has a short-term impact on mining investment. Therefore, I advise the Chinese mining companies and as do the management would look into the market demand for specific invested products. And as we said earlier, such as copper, the pricing trends for certain minerals the political situation in the project host countries during the investment period, and the short-term and long-term value of certain mineral resources. Timing of the investment. Chinese, investment com Chinese mining companies now tend to understand the industry cycle better. Some of the common reasons for the failure of previous Chinese mining companies' overseas investment is that the investments were made when the prices are at the highest level and later market downturns and cause significant losses. For example, Chalco's acquisition of the real Tanto shares. At that point, many of you may remember that Chalco joined hands with Alcoa to acquire 12% stake of real Tinto for US 14.05 billion US dollars and became Rio Tinto's single biggest shareholder in February of 2008, 
where aluminum price was at an all-time high. And aluminum price and Rio Tinto share prices plunged after the acquisition was completed. And China Coal suffered a significant investment loss of as much as over 80%. A hard lesson to learn for a Chinese mining company. A main issue that all of us face now is the counter-globalization and trade protectionism, which has re-emerged at certain, by certain countries and certain political leaders amid increasingly tense geopolitical relations and more policy uncertainties. And given such, the IMF has already noted significant decline in the global economic growth. However, at the same time, there may be high quality projects which are up for sale in the international mining market. Therefore, for Chinese mining companies that are aiming to go out and invest abroad, the current market actually may represent a good opportunity of mines that are under construction or in production rather than those that are green with investment. And hence, these are the projects that a mining company will be focusing on from the perspective of both timing and cost, and they will be making perhaps a more intelligent pricing decision when they're looking into such projects. Where to go and what to buy? According to the Global Mining Development Report of 2019, Basically, the regions for investment primarily focus on about 20 countries, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Angola, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Peru, where the mining output accounts for over 20% of each country's GDP. Therefore, these countries are more vigorously developing the mining industry, and in fact promoting the development of the downstream smelting industry, and hence more favorable foreign investment legislation, which may favor an inbound investment, whether it by a Chinese mining company or other international mining company. Secondly, Africa. Some Africa countries are in fact improving the regulatory environment of the mining and metal sector, thus attracting more global investment into such countries. And given the low level of industrialization, Greenfield investment may in fact create jobs in African host countries and enhance their productivity. And therefore, these projects may also attract Chinese investment. What kind of mineral resources may be favored by a Chinese mining company? First, copper, aluminum, rare earth, and lithium. There are 10 key areas that China plans to develop in the near future. New generation information technology, high-end CNC machine tools and robots, aviation and aerospace equipment, marine engineering equipment and high-tech ships, advanced rail transportation, energy shaving and new energy vehicles, power, agricultural equipment, new materials, biomedicine, and high-performance medical devices. Among these, new energy vehicles, power equipment, and high-tech manufacturing will all increase the consumption of copper, aluminum, and rare earth. Other would include cobalt and nickel, they represent both investment opportunities and risks given the technological changes in the battery industry. In the short term, cobalt's prospect will be negatively impacted because of Tesla's change to lithium iron phosphate batteries. However, we also note that cobalt and nickel in ternary lithium batteries will only be gradually reduced but not completely replaced, and they will remain as indispensable components of tannery materials.
based on the trend of partial substitution of lead acid batteries by lithium, lead represents fewer investment opportunities at this point. About 85% of the downstream consumption of lead in China is concentrated in lead acid batteries, which are widely used in motorcycles and or electric bicycles. And because of the new national standard for electric bicycles in China, it in fact forces manufacturers to give up lead acid batteries and adopt lithium batteries in order to increase the mileage. And hence, we can see there will be a decrease in the investment in such type of mineral resource. So at this stage, thank you for attending our webinar on Chinese outbound investment in the mining industry before and after COVID-19. I hope that we have shared with you some lessons that a Chinese mining company has learned historically as to the type of projects they have invested in, and I've shared with you as to the reason why there has been a slowdown in Chinese mining company outbound investment because of the various stages of development and the type of projects that a Chinese mining company has been invested in. In particular, the risk factor of consideration for a Chinese mining company that are both universal and specific because of the Chinese economy. And lastly, the countries which probably would most attract Chinese mining companies for outbound investment and the type of resources that will be needed that are unique and specific to the Chinese growing industry. I wish you all good health and hope that we'll be able to see each other uh, when um, COVID-19 um, eases and that we are able to have a face-to-face -face discussion more on this interesting topic. Thank you. And I now turn back to Rachel. Wow. Thank you, Hallam. That was an incredibly interesting uh, whistle-stop tour around the kinds of issues that Chinese investors are looking at when they're considering outbound investment. Um, a lot to digest and think about there. To, to our listeners, we hope you found that an interesting and informative session. As Hallam says, we look forward to seeing you again in person very soon. We hope you've enjoyed this Mining Insight series. We've enjoyed putting it together. And if you can think of some other topics, please let us know. Uh, we hope to be in touch with you very soon. Thank you again. Bye-bye.